You're listening to Cash and Sass. I'm Lisa Marie, your go-to gal for all things money. As the Sassy Wealth Queen and the brains behind the Sassy Wealth Coach, I'm here to take you on a thrilling ride from the financial chaos to sassy and sexy money. Welcome back, my sassy friend, to another episode of Cash and Sass. I'm Lisa Marie, your host and the Sassy Wealth Queen and the brains behind the Sassy Wealth Coach and, of course, this podcast. And today with me, I have Tony Schmaltz. Tony has a passion for helping people upgrade their lives in any area possible, specializing in mindset, wealth creation, which is my favorite thing in the world, manifesting relationships and happiness. He will help you live the life of your dreams. Tony has shared live or virtual stages, stages excuse me, with Les Brown, Tom Ziegler, Steve Chandler, and Waldo Waldman, Tana Gewartz. I know I butchered her name, <laughs> Kevin Sorbo, and so many more. Tony has spent most of his life in some sort of personal development. However, he hit it really hard in the last five years, spending over $250,000 to learn, grow, and succeed. His no-nonsense humor style of teaching and coaching gets people off their butts to take necessary actions such as in personal responsibility and choice stop, excuse me, and choice stop being a people pleaser, self-motivation, positive habits, disciplines, and persistence, time management, and focus finding true success and happiness. Tony began leading people to success more than 20 years ago, and in that time, he learned from many leaders, mentors, and coaches. He has helped many people find their success, careers, businesses, and lives through his time as a leader. He has helped many people find these successes through a specific style of calmly and politely telling how it is. I love telling how it is. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. And oh my goodness gracious, you were testing my English language yes. really. <laughs> and I think I failed spectacularly. I think I butchered some people's names. So from the bottom of my heart, I do apologize first and foremost for any names I butchered. Um, I absolutely love the fact that you help people in, in all their um in area of their lives as possible. And I love the fact that you get people off their butts, asses, however we want to say it, um, to actually move. I have a coach that does the same thing with me. Um, Well, basically, call. he says he calls me in, calls me forward um, to get me off my butt and move. And sometimes I don't do it willingly. And my trainer does the same thing. So I love, love that area. And I use not so nice language with my trainer um, all the time. (laughs) Um, we call it my workout language, right? One of the things I want to dive in with, with you is because you help create that, uh, the wealth mindset and, and do the wealth creation, which is one of the things I focus on as, as everybody knows, I focus on creating, retaining and expanding wealth aligned with the goals and values and their desires, because I believe that if it's not aligned, it's just not going to work. Um, is the abundance versus the scarcity mindset especially around money. Mm-hmm. Um, I also believe that uh, there's five wealth codes to being wealthy. So I believe in order to be truly wealthy, you should be wealthy in all areas. Mm-hmm. And that's um, spiritual, physical, mental, energetic, and financial. And you see, they all encompass each other. Yep. And so, and the abundance and scarcity all encompasses in all those areas. So, but it's, when it comes to the money, how do you see the abundance versus scarcity, like where people get stuck? Well, the the first and foremost, people get stuck because of the way they've been programmed, the way they've been taught by everybody growing up. Money doesn't grow on trees. Oh, that's too expensive. You can't afford that. You know, all these things we've been told our entire lives have caused us to think scarcely about money. And you have to save to earn. You have to, I mean, there's so many different sayings that we've heard. And so the first thing that I really help people with is turn those around. What could you say differently? Because what you speak into your world is what you're going to create. And if you're speaking scarcity scarcity on, around money into your world, you're going to create mm-hmm. scarcity in your life. Now, if you start mm-hmm. speaking and thinking more abundantly, then you're going to create that, that abundance. So the first thing is we try to, I, I first and foremost have somebody list down all the all the things they've heard about money, you know, like, like those terms, like money doesn't grow on trees, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned, blah, blah, blah. Write down as many as they can think of. And then I have them go through an exercise of turn that around. What could you say? You know, but money does grow on trees or there is, there's plenty of money out there. I don't have to worry about this and just recreate those phrases and speak them into your daily life. And I usually have them practice at least one of those. So you, you created these positive phrases around money. If there's plenty of money in the whole world, I'm there's never going to run out. There's always enough for everybody. Whatever that phrase is that they choose, that they prefer out of their list, 
practice for a week using that in your daily life. Somewhere, somehow, practice speaking that. Even if it's just a random comes up in conversation, like, oh, what? You know what? There's plenty of money for everybody out there in that world, in the world. We're never going to run out. We can get as much as we want or whatever that is. And you can be just talking to your friend. Mm-hmm. Getting them into the habit of speaking positively in the, into the world about money is a good first step. And it helps train your subconscious mind to start thinking better and more abundantly about money. Yeah, I call that, um, I actually call it, it's money stories, money st- stories that we've told ourselves about money, yeah. stories that people have told us. And I tell people, I said, you know, s- story's a story. Yes. You read a book, if you don't like the story, what do you do? You turn the page or you, you know, especially those online stories, you know, the stories that you can actually just dis- determine what's next. Oh. My kids are all into those, right? And a lot of adults are too. I'm like, okay, well, imagine that. If you don't like this story, turn the page. And choose a different one. Right. And so, yes, it's easier said than done. I understand that. And what I do with that is I call it flip the script. So we're flipping the script. And that's what you're basically you're doing. You're flipping the script. And I agree, practicing it every day. And I'll take it a, day, um, a little forward. I also said, um, have it wherever uh, you can see it all the time. Because a lot of times you'll say, yeah, I'm going to say it. And it's out of sight, out of mind. So I literally, when I was doing the work, I... St- wrote it in a permanent marker. So it was black, big, bold. <laughs> so I could see it on a sticky note. And I put it where it's the first thing you do in the morning or should be first thing you do in the morning. And the last thing you do, not you brush your teeth mirror. Yeah. So literally it would be on my bathroom mirror and I would see it. I would see it. You're immediately going to read it because there's something plastered right there in front of you on the mirror. And then I would say it to myself, right? So it's the first yeah. thing I saw, the last thing I saw. And Again, it's reprogramming your subconscious brain. I also went, I think I stuck it on my laptop. So like when I was traveling, <laughs> I lift the laptop up and there'd be two of them there. Nice. I got very creative because I know like for me, some people, if you put it, you say, yes, I'm going to say it, but then you don't have it in front of you. It's out of sight, out of mind, especially if you, you're, you got a significant other, you got kids, you got business, you know, we get life happens, we get busy. So I think that's really, really important. I love that. Um, your journey yourself, tell the listeners like how you journeyed from the scarcity to the abundance. Like uh, what's your story? Well, it took a couple of big crashes. Um, you know, I, I, I went from thinking abundantly to thinking scarcity, scarcity, and then back to abundant. Um, before I go on though, I, I love that you said sticky notes because I do the same thing. I got, I got this one says, yes. I am. <laughs> I still have, I still have mine too. <laughs> yeah, I do it. I do it all. And I, I, do cha- it all. And I change I change them every so often. <laughs> so, do I. I, so I love that you do. I said that I was like cracking up because I'm looking at all these around uh, my you're screen. You're looking at all your sticky notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, so my wife and I have been on and off entrepreneurs for the better part of to- over 20 years. Um, the last five of which have been almost five have been full-time. And so um, early on when I was still working in the corporate world, I was in quality assurance and, and it was just, it was miserable because in quality assurance, you're always dealing with that 1% negative. The company can do 99% positive, but I'm dealing with that 1% negative. It took a huge toll. And so my wife and I started out by being Amazon sellers and we had, we had built up a great brand and we were, we were doing roughly, roughly 20 to 25,000 a month in revenues. And well, the crash came was we had done all this on credit. We had been continuing to spend on credit just to get more inventory, get it into the Amazon warehouses. And our, we never trademarked our brand and somebody else came out with the same brand name, trademarked it and got us ripped off of Amazon. So there we were left with tons wow, of- they cease and desist and made you stop everything. Oh my goodness gracious. With about 11,000 units of inventory. So long story short, we had to take a loss on all of that. And we had bought most of that on credit because revenues were going so good. We didn't expect that to you know, go away. We're like, ah, we'll just keep flipping it around. So put us in a big sink, big sink. And that was the f- real crash that took us into that scarcity mindset. Now we're thinking that, oh my God, money doesn't grow on trees. We got all this debt. Fast forward about three years, four years, four years. And uh, I took another, taken another job. We lived in the Seattle area for most of our lives. And we, I took a job in Panama city, Florida the company moved us all the way across country. I'm thinking, okay, this is the next step in the right direction. Uh, corporations got great benefits. They're giving me the money I'm asking for paying for the entire move. I'm like, cool. 
get there and we moved there two months before Hurricane Michael, which plowed right over the top of us. Five, category five hurricane that we we rode out and yeah, it was it wasn't a fun experience. So and I'm if still you're not for, and for the record, if you're not from the south. And you're not used to hurricanes. It's kind of <laughs> like someone from the south going north and then getting a hit with a sh- huge snowstorm that y'all people up north are used to. <laughs> right. I grew up in the south, so someone says, oh, you're in a tornado. Oh, my gosh, are you okay? There's a tornado warning, a hurricane. I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I shrug. They're like, aren't you? Pay-? N- no. no. <laughs> I grew I. I I grew up here. I was born and raised here. I you know it's just same way with y'all with snowstorms, right? right? So, but if you've never been involved in something like that, and it, and I've like I've had one Category Five go through Sumters when I was like thirteen. It was Hurricane Hugo. Yeah. It was supposed to hit um, Charleston. It was never supposed to go inland. Again, I live inland. I don't live near the water, so I'm less likely to get an eye of the storm. Right. Okay, I will never say never because I was probably about 10 years old and Hurricane Hugo came straight to a sharp right turn yes. and went straight inland and it it destroyed. I mean, the way it picked up houses, thank goodness our our yard and our house was fine, but the way it picked up some houses in our neighborhood, I'll mm-hmm. I'll never forget. It is still scary. Um yeah. and tornadoes are scary. So I can imagine you moving and <laughs> Two months later. So the first time you're in the South. And, and of course, Panama is near water. So yeah, yeah. you're going to get hit um, a lot heavier than we do inland. Well, and very similar to your story, this storm was actually supposed to go to the west of us. It was supposed to hit Pensacola and maybe Mobile. And and at, when it was right offshore, there was like, it was, oh, it's a high category two. It might be a category three by the time it makes landfall. And that was at night. We go to bed, we wake up the next morning. They're like, oh my God, it's a five. And then we're like, I remember. And now you can't get out of town because everything shut down already. <laughs> So, yep. uh, but anyway, so it, the, the best you can do is you, you, you get away from the windows, you hunker yep. down in the middle, you make sure, you know, even when they say hurricane two, I, I still make sure all my stuff is charged just oh, because, we, uh, because yeah, they we, can only predict, they can only predict so much, but that's the mm-hmm. best you can, cause you can't, so many people try to leave and you can't. So how did her, how did that hurricane affect y'all though? So like, actually, believe it or not, the hurricane itself, other than the experience of hiding in a master closet for four and a half hours, <laughs> uh, other than that, welcome it, to the South. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah my wife's looking at me in the closet, going, "What did you get us into?" No, <laughs> uh, but actually, it was it was believe it or not, the storm itself was not what really took us back. The storm itself and the aftermath was actually quite lightning. Now, even though the damage was devastating, of course, I had never seen a community come together like that before. Mm-hmm. Everybody's helping everybody. It didn't matter what race, nationality, it didn't matter. Religion, it didn't it matter. Didn't matter. You mm-hmm. had a chainsaw, you were cutting somebody out. You were getting somebody, helping somebody out. It was amazing in that sense. Mm-hmm. The company I worked for, however, not so much. So, <laughs> so even though physically we recovered fairly quickly because it was a large corporation, they tum- dumped tons of money into the, the place to get it fixed back up and running within less than a month. We were running up, up and running in less than a month. But the, the leadership team and the, and the employees never really recovered. And so it became the worst led, most miserable place again <laughs> I'd ever worked. And I was just sitting there going, this was supposed to be the opposite. And uh, so it was about that time where I hired my first coach. And it was my first coach that really broke me out of that, that negativity and really started leading me back in the direction of the abundance mindset. I was reminded of the way I used to think. So I started just pouring that into myself and my, and my wife and our son. Um, and we were just like, just within just a few months of of working with this coach, I had completely turned it around and, and I had immediately decided that that's what I wanted to do. I'm like, I had fiddled around with some affiliate marketing, network marketing. You know, I, I still thought about the Amazon thing, but that was when all the tariffs and everything were going on. So I was like, well, coaching, I love helping people. I love turning people around and helping people find that. Like, Mm -hmm. like, like I did. It's empowering. Oh, big time. And so, Mm -hmm. so I actually, I actually uh, hired this coach. I've worked with that coach for three years and hired other coaches in between for different various reasons. So one was a breathing coach. One was a straight mindset coach. And 
when I, when my wife and I started speaking that into our world, our, our abundance mindset again, it just, it just started happening. Money started flowing and from places when you least expect it, when you really think positive, and a lot of people, for those listening out there, you know, when you think negatively about money, that's when you're, you're the most broke. That's when you're, you're, you look at the bills and you get stressed out. When you can think positive about money and abundantly about money, it's going to show up like you didn't even realize, like out of the blue, you're going to say, Oh, uh, I just got a new client or, Oh, I just got a refund on X, Y, Z. You know, you just, you the least expect it. You're going to have a check's going to show up in the mail from your mortgage company saying, Hey, you overpaid us. Here's a check. And you're like, Oh, cool. Um, so it really started turning around and, and from there, sort of my practice. And in 20 September, 2021, I was able to go see you later and, and take it on full time. And coaching has just been phenomenal since then. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I'm going to say something too, is it, just like what you were saying, what Tony was saying, what you focus on, you create more of. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I joke that I'm not, we, we, I'm, very analytical. And I still believe what you focus on, you create more of. And I also believe that um, I've been broke. So I've been where a lot of people are. I know what it's like to struggle to figure out what bill you're going to pay. Right. When I was let go, I was barely making ends meet. And, you know, my story is I then made the hard decision to have my vehicle repossessed and get on food stamps, which I was told I would never get off. Um, and I made that decision because I was done. I had migraines. I had tension headaches. I was a billing auditor of trust accounts at a foreclosure law firm. And I was a CFO. And let me just tell you the amount of stress that had accumulated because of the, ho mar the housing market crashing in 2008 mm -hmm. and all of those things. And even eight years later, it was... It was way stressful. It was more jobs being added and less people being on there. And the turnover um, that they would have, we actually used to celebrate when we made it through layoffs. <laughs> <laughs> it is so sad that I actually counted how many. I used to joke, I'm good because I made it through seven layoffs. I'm going, why in the world? <laughs> that should be a huge writing on the wall that in no way, shape, or form are any of us safe. Right, okay? right, right. Huge writing on the wall. Um, but it wasn't until I was let go and I made those hard decisions and, um, I heard a voice I was needed at home. Now was the time I found out six months later why. Um, and that's another story for another day. It was involving my daughter and my oldest. And I'm so thankful because I believe that if I wouldn't have been let go, I would have never been, even though it's what I wanted, I would have never ventured because you were getting that paycheck and taking some that big huge <laughs> risk like that is and for me i decided there was no plan b it had to work it had to because it was either that or i go back to corporate and i start taking excedrin tension migraine or excedrin tension headache medicine again like candy and i did i didn't want to um i lived on Amatrex, and I worked in with a lamp in my office, the lights off because the amount of migraines I had. And I just thought, okay, you know, it was just something I was always going to have to live with. Y'all, right. within six months, within six months of being out of that job, I've now, I've now been on my own business eight years this October, and I've had three migraines in eight years. Nice. Nice. Congratulations. Three. Three. <laughs> and they're nowhere near as severe as they were before. <laughs> right? Um, and right, I, I know. And when I first started, I didn't start off as a coach. It manifested into that, right? Because yeah. I went yeah. and started doing what I knew. I had my degree in, which found out I didn't want to do taxes any more than anybody else. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the because people come and go. And then I, even though I grew so fast, at the end of the year, I was still trying to figure out where the hell my money was. And I couldn't figure out why I was still struggling. And part of it was because of the mindset. You know, yeah. a coach said, if someone treated you like shit, would you stick around or would you come back? If someone talked bad about you, would you stick around and come back? I'm like, no. She's in yeah. line with money. I'm like, and that's when I did a huge deep dive into it. Money yeah. to that. Money stories. Money trauma. Money beliefs, um, how it 
you know, comes from generation to generation and how it affects our money management, how it affects our thinking and the abundance mindset. And that's where I started doing my work. And, yep. you know, I believe that what we focus on, we create more of. So even when you're having a hard day and I still re- do this to this day, I practice gratitude. That's another thing I do. I say thank you. So when I'm pumping gas, even if the business is taking a shift because, hello, the businesses are going to have shifts. When you're pumping the gas, saying thank you. Thank you that I have this money to put in the gas tank. Thank you that I was able to pay these bills. Um, You know, and just practice in that gratitude because, you know, even seven and a half years in, my business has taken another shift and the scarcity, I call them scarcity gremlin. The gremlin has shown up and this last time full, I mean, force in more ways than I could have ever thought possible in the last six months. And because of the coaches and support I have, I was able to lean in and learn even more um, tools that I could use to help me because I always say new level, new devil. So every, every time you go oh, yeah. up, you're going to have a new devil. And that's where that scarcity gremlin comes in and starts talking smack. Um, <laughs> and you know, you can't, one of the coaches told me you can't ignore it. You need to get up close and intimate with it. I mm-hmm. did not like it when he said that. Um, oh. <laughs> he's recently told me this by the way, but you oh. need to get, get up close and personal with the fear because the fear that you have is basically feeding that scarcity mind, that feeding that gremlin. Mm-hmm. And it hit me and I went, and the reason why I didn't like him is because he was right. Yeah. Because it got me thinking. I'm like, holy crap, you're right. And so that's some of the work that I've been doing over the last couple of weeks. I've been doing that. Um, and and getting up and close and personal is not something you want to do when, you, when, it, when it's something you're afraid right. of. Right. <laughs> I'm like, who wants to do that? And, and I, I love the fact that you're saying, you know, that you, you had this ups and these downs, right? And mm-hmm. you've been able to come back and rebuild. And I think it just shows that any one, anything is possible. And two, even us who's been, who's done the work, yeah. we experience times where we have to lean in and, and get some help because all of a sudden we can, we can feel the scarcity coming up. Um, yep. And we have to shift our mindset. And I just think it's really port- important. Um, one of the things that you said, um, and I guess, it, and this is partly of the scarcity and the abundance mindset, is taking ca- calculated versus um, <laughs> uncalculated <laughs> risks. So I want to first talk about the difference. Okay. I'm going to have you explain the difference because I just, I want some, I want them to hear it from somebody else besides me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because, because people can explain it. Di- we're probably both going to explain it slightly different and then someone may catch it better because I say there's, there's more than one way to say it or, you know, change your mindset. There's different things. I love the fact that we're aligned with the sticky notes and the flipping yeah. the scripts and all. Again, we both literally do the same thing on that part. We just call it different things, which is still the same thing. Um, but talking about that calculated versus uncalculated risks, because again, taking risk in our business is scary in itself, especially when you're the entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So first, let's explain what the difference is. Okay, so so calculated versus uncalculated. So if you take an uncalculated risk, you jump in with both feet without doing any research whatsoever. You're just kind of like throwing your money at something, hoping that it sticks and that it, it turns around. And I'll give you an example of both where I've taken both calculated and uncalculated. Where it's calculated, you do your due diligence, you do your research, and even if it is a large investment, you know that your your odds of return are much, much higher. And you're you're really looking you're gonna get a return on your investment. And so that's the short version. And should give you an idea to give you a, a an example of one of the uncalculated risks I took, which was very early on, right after we moved to Florida, or right about the time I had a coach and I had some extra funds and I we invested forty thousand dollars into a uh, a real estate investment with somebody who we didn't know. I didn't do my research on. I didn't do my research on the property that we were investing in. And this guy was getting ready to. He said he was close to finishing. He was getting ready to put it on the market. We were going to make back X number of dollars. And I did this based on a friend who said, "Hey, I've done business with this guy before. He's trustworthy." And so instead of me, where I would normally even as simple as Google, do your due, diligence, guy, do your yeah, due do my, diligence. 
do my due diligence on the property, on the person, on the business, et cetera. I didn't. I said, here's my $40,000. Property ended up going into short sale. We lost 36 of that $40,000. And so it was a painful lesson in, in the world of calculated versus uncalculated risks. So many, many other times have I, pretty much every time since then, <laughs> have I been very good about making sure that regardless, you know, as a coach or as an entrepreneur, we get reached out to people by people all the time. Hey, we got this program. I'm this coach. I'm this blah, blah, blah. So anytime, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. But if it sounds really good and there's a lot of information that goes along with it, then cool. And then I will take some time. I will. And, and everyone I've ever hired as a coach, some have been well-known names. Some are not so well-known, but I've told them flat out. I said, you know what? I am interested. You know, everyone wants to get their enrollment. Everyone wants to get their sale. I'm like, cool. I'm really interested. Give me a few days. I'd like to take a look at some things. What can you offer me? What can you send me? And, and I'll take my time and I'll I calculate. Okay, cool. If I spend X number of dollars, what's my risk? Okay, cool. I could lose X number of dollars. What's the upside here? What? How many pros and cons are there of investing this money into this program, into this person, into this property, into this business, whatever it is? And if those pros outweigh the cons, I usually try to go by a double factor, but if they outweigh the outweigh the cons, then you're you're in a you're in a much better place to make that investment. Yeah, and and I agree with that. And also um, with that, I also trust my um, my gut, my intuition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I also made an uncalculated risk. It was in 2020. Lord help me. Uh -huh. um, and it was a coach, and. The promises that were made were basically what you were saying is too good to be true. Like literally. And I even said this sounds too good to be true. And I should have known by saying that. And and when I say this, I'm a coach. I'm a wealth coach and CFO in one. I do not promise you that I'm going to help you make, I don't know, $50,000 a month. I don't do that. What I do is, is I tell you I'm going to help you support you and I'm going to show you how you can create retain and expand wealth on your terms, your values. I have some clients that wealth for them is making those five figures a month right at the 10 to 12 mark. And I have some that it's, I got a lot, several, there are a lot more than that. Again, what we consider wealth is going to be different because it depends on our values and our goals and our desires. Mm -hmm. What I was promised was all these tangible things. Like I was promised um, because he knew all these people and he spoke on these stages. He got his client on these stages too. I wasn't going to have to do, you know, do legwork. He, all I had to do was create my one sheet and he was going to put me in, period. The um, I saw... What is it? The shiny object, <laughs> yeah, shiny, shiny object syndrome. Shiny I got it. <laughs> objects. I saw nothing but shiny object and I wanted it more than anything. And during this time, we'd also agreed I need to, I need to rebrand because I, because I'd started off with the accounting um, and doing the taxes and all, I was Lisa Marie accounting starting off and it, we need to rebrand because that's not what I did. It's not who I was. So it was wrong. Right, right. So I now say that it was the most expensive rebranding anyone has ever done in history because that is the only thing, the only thing that came out of that yeah. um, was that. And the amount of money I invested was, I mean, it was, I lost, I lost all of it. Um, yeah. And it was over $30,000. Um, I think it was close to, yeah, it was 30, 35 for six months. And for the last two months, he was, like MIA, I couldn't even give him no calls, no nothing. Yeah, it was, wow. it was bad. Um, and so, you know, I had, now I could have done two things. I could have moped or, you know, just said, okay, that was it. It was done, was done, right? I didn't listen to one, to my intuition. I did not do my due diligence. And I mm -hmm. am adamant about my clients not making any huge investment without at least sitting on it for 24 hours. And there's right. a reason why I say that. Hence, what his example he just gave, and hence yep. my example I just gave. I yep. now don't do any huge investment without sitting on it for 24 hours. And during those 24 to 48 hours, I'm doing what he says I'm weighing my pros and my cons, I'm listing them out, I'm looking at it, I'm investigating what can you send me, what you know, depending on what it is, and I'm looking at it, and then I'm weighing it and I'm thinking about it, and then I mm -hmm. just sit with it and, and, you know, I'm analyzing it, but I don't, 
Try not to overanalyze it. And then you want to also trust your gut. And if you have questions in the process, make sure you ask them. Because yeah. I believe knowledge is power. So the more information we have, the more we can make a um, a knowledgeable and calculated uh, choice. Um, so, you know, and I'm the same way. Now, I don't do anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I want the information. I want to sit on it for 24 hours. I'm going to think about it. And, and it's even with my big coaches. The yeah. coach I have now, I absolutely love him to pieces. And I put, when I was at his uh, event, I said, um, I, you know, he said, are you in? And I said, I'm going to tell you yes. And I'm going to tell you, I want 24 hours to sit on it. And I want this information and I want to look at it. And I wanted to see what success he's had. Cause that was my <laughs> first mistake is I did not check to see what other successes yep, yep. this other person had. I went by what he told me and what he had on this website and come to find out there were several key things that if I would have asked some other people, I would have got the answers and I would have stayed away. Yep. Um, and it's lesson learned, right? And again, I rebranded and that's been the best thing in the world. So I just say it's it was the most expensive rebrand. <laughs> that's, well, that's, like- that's the way I look at it. Unfortunately, it was in the middle of COVID. Um, <laughs> so <sighs> there is that um, yeah, because yeah. it was in May of 2020. Um, and, um, and it is what it is. And the key thing is, is we take those and we learn from them. And what we want you to take from it is make sure you're doing your due diligence before you go. And I like the way you said it, uncalculate. You're just throwing stuff at it and you're hoping it'll stick. And that's with like anything, an yep. offer. That's with investing money into whoever. Um, you want to make sure um, that, um, you know, your ROI and what you're going to get back is going to be worth it. Now, and sometimes your ROI is not going to be money. That needs to be stated. Um, <laughs> In his case, it should have been. My case, it wasn't. It was supposed to be exposure. But again, yep. your ROI sometimes isn't going to be money. And you still want to make sure you're making or doing a due diligence. How does that affect the abundance and scarcity mindset with m- making sure you're making those calculated risks versus uncalculated? Well, re- real quick, before I get into that, I love how you said your gut and, and going with your gut. because and, and for you guys listening out there, one of the things I talk to about with my clients or with any people that aren't even clients, in fact, even people that haven't become clients, usually you can tell within the first 10 minutes of talking to somebody, if it's somebody you want to move forward with at all. If you have that, that guts telling, you no, like Lisa Marie was telling her, no, walk away, just walk away. I mean, you could always come back to them later, but there's no reason to make a quick decision when your guts telling, you no, there's something not right here, then there's probably something not right. So walk away. <laughs> Um, the key, okay, is, but, the key is to actually listen to it and be yeah, in, yeah. in tuned into it. Yeah. And then if you do, your gut is saying, I really like this person. I want to learn more, spend the time to learn more before we just jump it in just to make mm-hmm. sure do that mm-hmm. due diligence. Uh, so to, to your, to your question, when you have those, those uncalculated risks and you're, you're throwing something at the wall, hoping it sticks and it won't very, 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 very few times. If you have a horseshoe up here, you know what? You might get lucky. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, other than that, the most majority of times it's not going to work out. And that most cases will put people into that scarcity mindset. They're like, oh my God, I just lost all this money. What am I going to do now? I'm All the money's gone or that chunk of money's gone. And so you automatically, in general, we're human beings. It happens. Welcome to planet earth. Um, We just tend to go that direction. We tend to take ourselves to that negative. And it's important, much more important at that time to have somebody bring you back. Like you're talking about, like I'm talking about having a coach or having a mentor or somebody close to go, Hey, I'm really having Steve. I'm really having a moment, man. I'm uh, this just happened. What can we do? What can we talk about? And those are huge because those can bring you back. Now, when you have the calculated risks, and they do, like you said, the ROA, the ROI, be very clear. I want to agree with you 100%. The ROI is not always money. I've talked about hiring mindset coaches. I never intended to make a single penny out of the programs I was going with them. It was about adjusting my, shifting my mind and where, where I was well, thinking. Hire, and hiring my OBM, let me just tell you, she saves me time. My ROI is my time. Yeah. And not, nothing to do, my OBM and my VA, the, the ROI on that is time. Yeah. And so again, your ROI is going to, yes, is not going to always be money. Nope. 
Nope. Uh, but however, when you do take those calculated risks, not only not only are you feeling more abundant going in because you've done your due diligence, you're feeling that confidence. You're like, yeah, I checked all this out. This does look as good as it is. I'm in. I am all the way in. So now you're going in with that confidence. You're going in with that belief that it's going to work. You're going in with that abundance thinking because you know what you're going to get out of this, regardless of what that ROI is. And it just keeps you there. And then when you get it, you're even more confident to keep on going and, and motivated to do more and more and more. So that, the, and really that's the biggest difference I see or that, that actually has affected me. When I take the calculated risk, it tends to work out and you tend to keep thinking more abundantly. When you take the uncalculated risk, tends not to work out and you bring yourself back to that negative scarcity mindset. Yeah. 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 I, I, I totally agree. Um, we, this is something I could talk about for, I don't know, ever. Um, I wish I've pretty much said on all my episodes, I think, um, <laughs> because, which is also, again, why I started the podcast to begin with, because I love talking about money and I think, and, and all the ins and outs of it, especially with the abundance mindset and the scarcity mindset. And just, you know, here's the thing. What we think is what we create. So mm -hmm. what we focus on, we create more of. So if you're saying you're never going to make money and you're, thinking you're never going to make money, then you're never going to make, you're never going to make money. Right. If you're saying there's not enough money and you're thinking there's not enough money, then you're, you what you, what you put out in the world is there's not enough money. So that's the reason why I think it's really important that you focus on the abundance and flipping that yeah. script. And I know Tony is going to agree with me that yeah. what you think of is what you create more of and what you put out in the world. So you want to flip it so you can change it. And what I was also saying was, it, and this is really big, is that it's not do once and work on it and then never have to do it again. You're going to always, 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 always have to work on that yep. mindset. Um, Tony's even said he has mindset coach. I have a coach. He's done the, he's done work for several years. I've done work for several years too. And if I'm not mistaken, he just said he was also doing the, still doing work. And I just admitted I'm still doing very yep, deep yep. work. Um, because a little scarcity gremlin of mine decided to, you know, to appear. And so it's really important. Um, this is just a really important subject. Um, Tony, you have a free offer for the listeners. Will you please tell them what that is? Yeah. So this is more, those, this is for anybody who out there is trying to get sales or, or clients. If you're a consultant or a coach and it is a, it is an actual free, uh, free course, digital course on getting referrals, referrals, especially for coaches and consultants can be one of the best things you can do. And most people aren't utilizing the people they already know. So this is a huge one. So if you go to, uh, upgrade referrals.net, upgrade referrals.net, and you'll get your and you'll get your absolute free copy of the seven module course that will get you <clears throat> all the referrals you're looking for. And I've literally built my entire coaching business around this baseline program. So a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Okay, so that was that was upgradereferrals.net. Yes, correct. <laughs> and okay, we will make sure that, that I want to make sure I had it right because I'm we're gonna make sure I'm gonna make sure it's put in the show notes yeah. so that you can grab it. Um, and Tony, thank you so much for being on with me today. This was a lot of fun. And again, I could have, I could sit here and talk about me this too. all day. Um, and I truly appreciate it. Um, and, um, I'm hoping my sassy listener that what you got out of this is you can see there's some ways that you can take it and flip those scripts and that, um, mm. how to do your due diligence before you make those investments. So I am sure I'm going to be bringing him back on later. Again, another time, I've already decided that. So until next time, stay sassy, my friend. Thanks for joining us this week on Cash and Sass. Check us out on social media and on our website at www.thesassywealthcoach.com where you can download my free Money Story Start Guide. The website again is www.thesassywealthcoach.com. And as always, subscribe to the show to catch every new episode and leave us a review so we can continue to bring you fresh content. And remember, yes, it is possible to have sassy and sexy money. See you next week.